Welcome to Yale. Uh, this is a, a, great, uh, a great kind of conference for the School of Management to host. Uh, let me give you three minutes on my own history with the management school and you'll see why I'm particularly friendly to what you're doing. I was 20 years ago chairman of the political science department here. Uh, the city was a wreck. Uh, it was, uh, uh, there was a real discussion of bankruptcy. Uh, the police department was completely ineffectual. 30,000 class one crimes in a city of 130,000 in the year 1989. Um, my friend John Daniels uh, was elected the first African American mayor. And in desperation, when he couldn't find anybody who understood cities to be the chief bureaucrat, he asked me to do it. And I did it. And uh, it was a real jolt. Uh, the jolt was uh, that I had grown up in a university founded on the silo. The academic departments of a high-end American university are perfect silos. Comparative literature uh, knows nothing of Charles Dickens or John Updike. It only compares literatures. Uh, and political science knows very little, or it, I, it, we may have gotten a little better, but I'm not so sure of that, about the cross currents that are involved in making something complex really work, and really work from the point of view of the people it's supposed to work for. And certainly when I uh, became the chief administrator of New Haven, it wasn't working uh, for the people of the city. And I worked really hard for a couple of years. And when I left, it still wasn't working very well for the people of the city. Uh, and the answer for me was that the silo called political science uh, was not really a great place to, to learn how to make things work. So my response was to move from the political science department to the management school. I got there and I discovered the following fact that management education was siloed into its own system of academic disciplines, and that uh, the alchemy of an MBA, it was then an MPPM, Master of Public and Private Management, the alchemy, and we're actually better at this than most management schools, the alchemy is that you have a faculty of 100 people, none of whom have ever run anything. and many of whom are vaguely hostile to the idea that somebody should run some. <laughs> right, so that's a hard way to run a, run a railroad, much less a management school. And um, so I was involved in a movement here seven or eight years ago where we tried to undercut the silos and make everything taught from the point of view of some practitioner's point of view or from a customer's point of view. Uh, so I teach a course which is how business looks to government. And so, you, so it's the role play for the students is to imagine themselves uh, on the FDA side of a transaction with a pharmaceutical company. Uh, or on the urban government side of uh, the delivery of uh, health services to poor people. And it actually, it actually is a, a very powerful instrument for education. The watchword of it is cognitive empathy, which is, a, that's classic academic language. But the, the gist of it is seeing how the world looks to critically placed others. And another name for that might be laying the groundwork for interoperability. And what good management anywhere does is to bring together uh, people whose goals and objectives uh, interdigitate and get in one another's way. Uh, the classic instance for me was uh, to discover two programs, one having to do with making stoplights respond when, you, when cars line up on the red side and switch in accordance. So we've got a 
technological effort to make stoplights a little smarter. At the same time, another part of city government is working on improving the smoothness of streets. And so we have people installing magnetometers in a street in February and somebody else with a plan to mill up that street two months later, right? And that struck me at the time as an extraordinarily cartoonish uh, piece of craziness. But in actual fact, things like that happen all the time. Absolutely all the time. And the, the learning process that you're engaged in uh, is, uh, from my point of view, entirely admirable and uh, absolutely essential. So uh, when Daniel uh, called, I, for, I forget when we first talked, a year ago? About a year ago. Uh, I, I'm, like everybody else, I'm lazy and try to protect my time. But I, I said, wow, you're really onto something there. And I have no idea, I, I didn't know how to do this when I was in city government, and I don't know how to do it now. So I will not give you even a word of advice about the specifics of what you're trying to achieve. But I will try to put it now in context. And let's see if we, and I'm gonna indulge myself by ascending to a very high level of generality. Uh, look at the picture on the screen. Um, you have a pretty good idea what happens next? <laughs> and are you puzzled by it? What, he has a hat and an umbrella. And so what do you suppose he thinks that umbrella is going to do for him? Maybe it provides a little wind resistance as he goes downward, <laughs> slows his descent, parachute style. Uh, well, the, the world we inhabit is full of people riding bicycles like that and full of organizations that are in about that condition. And I, I want to look at that under uh, three themed headings. Uh, the first is something new under the sun. The idea here is that we live in an era different from any other era in human history when it comes to how complicated, how, a complicated, how complex the world is and how fast it moves. Uh, second, uh, we live in a turbulent world. Uh, third, we live in a world where learning from failure is the single most important skill. And I'm gonna use uh, three great students of political economy uh, as guideposts here. Uh, I, most people don't expect to come to a management school and have Karl Marx uh, appear on the screen the first, first conversation, but there he is on the left. Uh, and Joseph Schumpeter in the center. Uh, Schumpeter uh, was, uh, in my view, the greatest 20th century economist because he, uh, most economists in the 20th century were trying to chase physics and produce equilibrium theories that made, the, made Newton's notion of interplanetary uh, gravitational fields the basis of economic thought. And anybody who's been out in the economy knows that equilibrium is not the main story, right? The main story is radical change followed by momentary equilibrium followed by radical change. Uh, Schumpeter got that idea across in a very effective way. And then finally on the right, uh, both figuratively and liter literally, is F.A. Hayek, who uh, most people associate with a very conservative point of view, uh, but actually he's not that. He is a radical thinker about the creative possibilities of a free society. Uh, this, I, since there were three guys, I thought I'd better put a woman in. And this is Joan Robinson, who was a great Cambridge economist. And she had a, uh, a one sentence rep retort to Marxism, which has lived uh, in the half century since her death. 
And it is, there is one thing worse than being exploited by capitalists, and that is not being exploited by capitalists. All right, something new under the sun. Uh, this chart begins at the time of Christ on the left and finishes uh, in the present on the right. Uh, the vertical scale is gross, dom gross domestic product per capita. Um, and you can imagine there's a little guesswork somewhere <laughs> in the data. Uh, but there is actually a great, a great economic historian named Angus Madison, spelled with one too many Ds. He never did learn to spell his name correctly. Um, and uh, he's done absolutely remarkable inductive work with the texts from classical antiquity and early modern Europe and so on. And uh, this basic story stands up, that in the 10,000 years after the coming of settled agriculture until the 1600s, there was no case of mass affluence in world history. Mass affluence by modern standards. And there, there were coercive elites in the Greek city-states, in uh, China at about the year 1000, uh, in Rome. Uh, but in every case, there was coercive redistribution of agricultural product from hinterland to uh, metropolitan city. Uh, which meant that it wasn't really what we're talking, it really wasn't modern wealth. And the question of how this happened is profoundly important. And Marx, uh, Marx and his colleague Engels, writing in the winter of 1847, uh, made the following observations. Conservation of old modes of production in unaltered form was on the contrary, the first condition of existence for all in earlier industrial classes. Drop the word industry. The world ran on a fundamentally conservative basis of preserving technologies, preserving beliefs, preserving systems of uh, property and agriculture. I'm in a lot of trouble here. There we go. Capitalism, during its rule of scarce 100 years, has created more massive and more colossal productive forces than have, preceded, uh, than have all preceding generations together. It's true. The amount of productive, um, of production and the quality of production has changed in every generation for the last 10 generations at a higher speed than it changed at any time in human history. So when you look at uh, a county or a region, uh, you're looking at something which is moving at a very high pace. It may seem to stand still, but it isn't. The technological forces, the competitive forces, the cultural forces, the popular uh, entertainment, all those things are changing at a rate which had never been seen in the world before. And uh, that makes it kind of hard to deal with. Now, the, most people ascribe this to technology. Uh, and I don't. The first time there were settled governments that controlled large geographic areas was in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, the Treaty of Westphalia is what most people focus on. Government created the framework uh, which made this rapid change and rapid development of mass affluence possible uh, for the first time. Well, and that's a little too much of that. <laughs> How are we doing on time? When, when does the hook come? I've got about 20 minutes? Okay. Uh, then I'll stop and tell this story. Um, this is a, this is a uh, court case from 1881 called Gen versus Rich. And uh, it's, 
it illustrates something about government in a market society that is worth remembering. Uh, and it is that government doesn't just decide uh, what's right. Government decides also what's wise. And wise from the point of view of the commonwealth, the common good. Uh, and it does that by thinking about incentives when it's smart. Uh, the story of Gen versus Rich goes as follows. This is a story off wealthy Massachusetts on Cape Cod. It is, in 1881 is the very end of the period when whale oil was a more Im important commodity than uh, petroleum. Think of that. And think of the, the rate of change that's implied by going from whale oil in 1880 to a world dominated by petroleum by 1920. That's the kind of rate of change we're talking about. Um, again, and his uh, employees who are on a 60-foot ship kill a finback whale. And finback whales are wonderfully uh, rich in oil, uh, but they have the peculiar property that no other whale has, that when killed, they sink to the bottom of the sea. And they don't rise for two or three days, and when they do rise, they float uh, as the currents take them. Now, Gen kills the whale, and a guy named Rich, a guy named Ellis finds the whale on the beach near Wellfleet. A guy named Rich buys it at auction uh, from Ellis, uh, tries the oil, that is, extracts the oil, and then puts the oil on the market. And by this time, Gen catches up and says, that's my whale. And the trial in Gen versus Rich is decided as follows. What's the usual law for how we do property? Every child knows the most fundamental rule of property law. <laughs> Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. <laughs> right? And that actually is the general law of capture in uh, hunting industries. And the judge looks at this case and says, but let's think this through. If we apply finders, keepers, losers, weepers to finback whales, who will risk life, limb, and property to kill such a whale? So he says, no, the whale belongs to Gen, not because of some abstract principle from the sky, but because if you want the economy to work, the next year, you have to define property rights so that they correspond with a reasonable incentive for people to risk life, limb, and property in pursuit of the product. Now, of course, if you know we're, we're in Croon Hall, and how to kill whales is really not appropriate here. <laughs> so if you look at it from the point of view of Croon Hall and whales, and those who love whales, uh, the proper solution would be finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And the oceans would, have been, would be much fuller today of finback whales than they are if you had done it that way. Okay, now I want to um, do a data animation. Well, let's see if I can do this. Uh, the, data anima the data chart you have here, let's study it static for a minute, then we'll set it to motion. The uh, bubbles are countries. Uh, the vertical dimension, um, yeah, that's not true. That, it, don't read this chart. <laughs> the vertical dimension on what I'm going to show you is longevity, life expectancy at birth. Uh, and the horizontal dimension, is uh, GDP per capita, uh, norms for inflation, and shown on a logarithmic scale. The logarithmic scale lets us see the small differences on the left better than we would see them on a linear scale. And the bubbles are color-coded uh, so that the Americas are yellow, uh, Eurasia is orange, 
Asia is red, Africa is blue. Um, and I'm going to show you now a little over 100 years of world economic history in about one minute, with any luck. Okay, so uh, the Middle East is, is bright green. India is unique. In India and Pakistan together are uh, light blue. And the diameter of each bubble corresponds to the size of the country. So the really big red bubble is China, and the really big blue bubble is India. And the year is shown in the background. We're now in 18, 1830. This is about the time Marx wrote what I attribute to it. Okay, what happened there? Say again, please. Okay, we have a rising tide measured in both wealth and health. Okay, um, and does it have a smooth flow to it or is it a little jumpy? It's very jumpy. Uh, and is it evenly distributed or unevenly distributed across countries? Very unevenly distributed. And the diagram is, um, you know, every good diagram simplifies the world mercilessly. And what this diagram leaves out is what's going on inside each bubble. Let's play it one more time. Uh, notice that the Africa story shown in Sub-Saharan Africa story, is a particularly tough one. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to bell the United States, if I can. So we're recording every year on the US story. Um, did anybody plan all that? Anybody in charge of all that? Absolutely not. It's all out of control. Right? And the ancients would be horrified by it. The ancients would say this is anarchy. All the established ways of life are torn asunder one after another. Uh, and without tearing them asunder, you can't do what happens in that diagram and what is happening in the world you guys are valiantly trying to administer. Schumpeter. Uh, Schumpeter was an Austrian. Uh, had been a banker in Austria before he became an economist. He failed miserably and made a lot of other people poor. He wasn't a crook, he just failed. Um, having failed at banking, he went to Harvard to teach banking. <laughs> um, his best line, he's actually a really great economist, uh, his best line was, I aspire to be the world's greatest economist, greatest lover, and greatest horseman. I've accomplished two of those things without riding a horse. <laughs> there was an ego there. Um, uh, he, uh, he had a summer house here, and the Yale Economics Department made him an offer every summer, and he said, ev said no every summer. Um, he's buried up in Litchfield. Um, 
His theory of capitalism is the bicyclist. Uh, the theory is, he calls it creative destruction. Is that a term any of you have heard? Hum if you've heard it, okay? Uh, creative destruction means uh, that at any given moment, most people in the economy are focusing on a certain way of producing goods and services, a certain transportation technology, a certain set of assumptions about the economy, and they're chasing madly after each other in that, while somebody else is walking away and saying, let's do this very differently. In fact, not just somebody, one somebody else, but uh, thousands of somebody else's. Uh, we call them entrepreneurs. Uh, people go off and do crazy things in the economy. And 90% of them fall like the bicyclist. 90% of them are doing something as dumb as riding in the rain with an umbrella so you can't hold both, both sides of the handlebar. Most of them are doing that, but a few of them will get something right. And when they get something right, they will hit the conventional economy in the back of the head with a two by four. And there'll be a crisis. And it happens over and over and over. And this is actually a representation done by, uh, done by one of the Wall Street firms. And Schumpeter would be horrified by it. But I'm gonna get the hook if I try to do it better and more complicatedly. Um, the industrial, you, you start with in the 1700s on the left and end up in the end of the present century on the right. And you've got the, uh, the uh, textiles became the initial focus of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, there was enormous wealth to be built in that. Uh, and then railways uh, became the defining grid, railways and ocean shipping. Uh, then autos and trucks, then computers, then distributed intelligence, then nanotechnology on this chart. The main point is that technologies are shifting really fast. And you've got to all be painfully aware of that, right? The, the uh, wonderful technology of the ancient date 2005 is already being undermined in most fields. And that's the design of the system, and it's what accounts for the incredibly high rate of economic expansion, which is made possible. But of course, with that high rate of, of expansion go moments of radical contraction, and we're in the midst of one of those. We are very much in the midst of a period of, of contraction and grievous harm grievous harm to innocent people in every city uh, and, uh, for that matter, rural township uh, in the country. Uh, much more extreme in some cases than others. Uh, but most of them, most of the people who are being really hurt by this are not uh, driven by extraordinary greed. It is just that the system thought up something really complicated Right? And the derivative instruments that became the dominant focus on Wall Street in the last 10 years were so really complicated that even their inventors did not understand their dynamic. The AIG, the AIG story is one in which we, I, I actually have a colleague who invented some of that stuff. And uh, neither he nor anybody else really understood uh, its potential uh, for harm. Now, in, a, in a, a, a political economy of the kind Schumpeter describes, here's how growth occurs. Each on the, on the lower axis is the amount of money and effort we invest in something, and on the vertical axis is how much gain we make from it. And the lines take the green one, are production functions. They tell us what we get for how much effort or investment. And the, in most lines of work, moving from number one to number two on the green line 
is what everyday business and management is about. But in the Schumpeterian world, while you and I are struggling to get from one to two, some smart guy like Dan Stein says, well, how about this pink production idea? And he manages to shift over to where the three is. And then other people jump on board and start trying to make their way from three to four. And while they're doing that, uh, decades may pass, but while they're doing that, somebody else jumps from struggling with four over to the blue curve and says, let's do five. And up the blue curve to six, and so on. So there is this highly disruptive, right? And if you look at all the, if you look, it, it, it's, the windows are up, but if, if the windows are shaded, but if you raise these shades and look out that way, you'll see the Winchester Repeating Arms plant, which as late as the Korean War, employed 26,000 people full time. It now employs nobody. Uh, and that is occasioned by one of these Schumpeterian crises, right? It was a crisis in methods of production. That plant was built around die cast, die -cast manufacturing with high skill machinists. And people devised a way to, to manufacture what, what were actually worse guns at vastly lower cost elsewhere with a different technology. Uh, finally, Hayek. Um, once, 40 years ago, when I was a young man, I assert that was true, <laughs> uh, I was giving a lecture to a group about this size, and they wheeled a guy in in a wheelchair. I was talking about economics. They wheeled a guy in a wheelchair, and it was Hayek. I've never been so nervous in my life. Um, this guy has a, has a really great idea. And the idea is, it's actually a repackaging of Schumpeter with an emphasis on learning. And uh, his idea uh, goes under the heading, Creative Possibilities of a Free Society. And he explains the enormous productivity of the last few centuries by reference to uh, economic freedom, people's right to do things in new ways. Uh, not just because of government policy, but because the spirit of the age encouraged experimentation, encouraged uh, risk taking, and ceased to punish failure with draconian penalties. Uh, and so the total scale of knowledge, right, and this, this is not just business, this is science as well, science and engineering. The total scale of knowledge increases exponentially. And the implication of that for any given individual <laughs> is that the individual's grasp of the total knowledge of, in her or his society goes down, 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 down. Right, in a relatively simple agricultural economy 500 years ago. A smart person uh, situated in an ordinary role in that society could grasp, let's imagine, 25% of what everybody in the place knew. Now, what percent, let's take the smartest person in this room and let's just, just, I think it's you. Uh, what, what percentage of what's known in our world could we expect you to know? Way less than a percent, some minor fraction of one-tenth of a percent if you're, a, if you're a wizard smart person with a great education. So the, the humility that implies from the individual point of view is pretty great. And the idea that knowledge is critical is very important. I mean, the 
civilization which no brain has designed, but which has grown from the free efforts of millions of individuals. That's what we're faced with, right, is a world that is extraordinarily intricate. And what you're doing uh, in Stewards of Change is trying to find threads of coherence and trying to provide coherence for your clients. And if you think about Hayek's generalization from the point of view of people who have uh, fewer than average resources, uh, people who have acute medical needs, uh, people who need uh, economic help, people who need uh, counseling and other forms of help from government, the bewildering complexity of the world we live in is overwhelming. And providing through interoperability a kind of, a kind of coherence uh, is a noble purpose. And it's one which um, has enormous possibility. If we, you look at the temperament, the temper of the country right now, right, there's enormous anger and enormous aspiration at the same time. Um, I'm an Obama guy, uh, but I have some friends who aren't, and they are most emphatically uh, enraged by the president. Um, and that's, I think, this, the thing that enrages them most is that he's opened the agenda to all the really hard issues in a very short period, right? He inherited a war and a half, and now we have a war and a half, but we've, the, the one is in Afghanistan, whereas the one was in Iraq before. Um, we have this health care reform bill, which is just exquisitely complex. Have any of you read as much as 100 pages of the bill? I, I did it. I, I read three or 400 pages of it. And what's interesting about it is you can see how it was put together because um, every interest group was, or every interest group that was well represented got something, right? That's how they put the, put the coalition together. And it's actually, that's in, a, that's in a way, it's terribly wasteful. It's also, though, potentially an experiment. There was a wonderful New Yorker piece two weeks ago comparing the Department of Agriculture with the health care bill. The Department of Agriculture ran a 3,000 county experiment in how to do agriculture. And that experiment went on for more than a century and a huge amount of learning came out of it. And so in, an, in the same sense as Hayek or Schumpeter would recognize. And um, given my record in city government, and I, 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 I won't, bore you with the details. Uh, but putting in community policing, for example, which I thought then and think now was a great idea, uh, selling that idea to a police force which had a military model based on rapid response with Ford Victoria automobiles, the Crown Vic, rather, Right, the Crown Vic that goes 120 miles an hour down the street to solve a crime. Um, I learned a lot of humility from dealing with those guys. <laughs> the, um, the same with the fire department, trying to cross train people so that firemen could run ambulances and ambulance guys could be firemen. We had 11 different union locals to deal with, and that was three locals between ambulances and fire. You can imagine how well that went. Um, the, fire, the, the, the head of the firemen's union told the following joke on local television. Where, does, where do you call when Douglas Ray has a fire at his house? Sisk Brothers Funeral Home.
Well, <laughs> I've retreated, as you can see, uh, to a different, different kind of work. Uh, and I greatly admire those of you who are uh, learning to make these things work in an interoperable way. Thank you very much. Pardon? Yep. Some time for a few questions. We'll take a break. Do you want to uh, pose some ideas? Questions? Yes, Karen. I, I was particularly interested in your last point about failure, because, of course, you know, we tell our children that failure is the best way to become a better human being, and obviously, failure is also critical to a successful economy. But we also, at the same time, have a public that finds it intolerable intoler when its government fails. Absolutely. And the, you know, the recent example with the, with the attempted bombing was a perfect one. That, that change in itself might be incredibly positive in terms of how, how systems talk to each other. But yet, people want heads. I guess my question for you is, how do, you, how do, we, how do we reconcile that dichotomy in terms of government so that systems are able to embrace as part of their driving methodologies, a culture of failure, which seems kind of antithetical to what they're hired to do. That's a really great question. Uh, it reminds me of Bart Simpson's line, trying is the first step on the road to failure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's a, it's really hard, right? Because, um, I mean, the basic logic goes that government alone has the right to impose taxes. And, you know, and the, the basic theory of the state, right, is that government has a monopoly on force, right? The worst that Microsoft can do to you is fire you. And the government of the United States can do a lot worse than that. So there, it gets held to a different standard. But then when you ask it to solve uh, really complex problems, like the ones you folks work on, uh, avoiding the risk of failure is a very counterproductive strategy, right? And it, it happens all the time. CYA, keep your head down, all those, all those common reflexes that uh, I learned to develop, I developed them pretty fast when I was in government. Um, it's a real issue, and I, I think part of it you need you need a, um, the success stories, the cases where people have gotten away with innovation and failure have by and large been ones where uh, a part of government built a massive constituency that was well represented in, uh, among opinion leaders and K Street lobbyists. And that's a lot easier for uh, branches of government that serve the rich and powerful than for branches of government that see, serve the poor and needy. And so uh, the book, there's a good book on this by a guy named Daniel Carpenter. I, f I forget the title of the book, but it, if you type in Daniel Carpenter to uh, Amazon, you'll find it. Um, I, you know, that's a vexed question, and I don't thoroughly know the answer. I think having alliances in the university world is one part of it. Um, having, um, if you think about all of the interest groups that you would be most obviously adjacent to, building those relationships, but most of, you know, the, uh, the, the public sector union movement is pretty conservative, it's pretty risk averse in its, in its approach because everything is about, you know, not getting hammered. And uh, so it, it's not a natural ally in that. It's a great question, so great that I have very little to say in the way of an effective <laughs> answer. Another question? Okay, but yes. Well, continue on that thing, okay. Um, Obviously, bureaucracies are risk averse, by, by definition. But it seems like part of what 
preserves silos in government or anywhere else is the ability to externalize risk. If I can put all the risk yep. in your silo, I protect myself. How do you overcome that? You're asking hard questions. I'm an <laughs> academic. Um, it's, it's a very hard question, right? And the um, the and and you know the the to rub it in. If you look at what business strategists do, it's exactly that, and they have the instruments for doing it, right? The um, I'll tell you who I would be in touch with. Um, it's a guy named Mike Critelli, C R I T E L L I. Critelli is the board chair and former CEO of Pitney Bowes uh, and the board chair of something called DOSIA, D-O-S-S-I-A. DOSIA is a health record system uh, and it's sponsored by 10 huge employers, uh, including Walmart. And it is working in parallel with what you're doing. And Critelli is, uh, he lives in Fairfield County. I had him up to talk to students two weeks ago, and he was uh, just fabulous. And he's wrestling with all the questions you're wrestling with. And on this subject, the 10 big companies he's dealing with are in a position where they have to internalize risk. They've all made up their minds that they have to have effective healthcare uh, information and services for their workforces. And they're worried as worried about, they're, they're less worried about absenteeism than what they call presentism, where people come to work unable to actually work, and where uh, billions of dollars are lost uh, to the bottom line through failure to serve that part of the workforce. And I, I guess what I would say is making alliances, just literally ejecting risk to others. Um, usually you can find a way to punish people for it. Um, and finding alliances where you get your arms around a pool of risk and do the best you can with it. Um, and I do think the, the alliances, the cross-sectoral alliances are probably very important and promising uh, for uh, a movement like, like yours. One last question before coffee. Yes. I guess I'll try to make it hat trick here. I'm seeing the same vein uh, of the last two questions. Um, we saw in one of your uh, in one of your charts up there um, how free society uh, impacts uh, total knowledge and, yep. and productivity and per capita income and and those kinds of things. As we're sitting here in this room. Uh, preparing to go forward with what we hope will, will be interoperability in our, in our industry, um, the federal government is poised to influence, uh, poised to, uh, to uh, really significantly influence the healthcare industry with healthcare reform. And I'm yep. wondering, I'll try and get to my question here. Um, with the federal government asserting so much influence in the process vis-a-vis -vis healthcare reform, um, in your opinion, what are our odds of, of succeeding when the government influence really goes against the tenets of a free society? Um, wow. Uh, first of all, I think it's complicated about the extent to which it does and doesn't go against the tenets of a free society. Um, the, the reason I pretty strongly believe in universal health care coverage uh, is that, um, think about the Schumpeter story, right? Uh, you have to expect that hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of people, are going to be on the wrong bus at any given moment. Right? They're going to be working for a firm that is in the process of failing, and, or for an industry which is in the process of precipitous decline. So uh, self-reliant, there are, will be at least moments when you need some government help down there. Uh, the, the larger question, and, and I, I agree, I mean, for, I, I actually did a little teaching of this with executive ed and with a corporate group. Um, the most striking thing is that it creates uncertainty for everybody in the system, 
when, you're, when you are where you are right now, right? Just trying to figure out the implications of each of the several hundred provisions in this bill for any given enterprise is dauntingly complex. And uh, what, I, what I think is promising in the political landscape from your point of view right now, and your choice of speakers uh, tomorrow and the next day reflects it, uh, is that the leadership, much of the leadership in the country gets it about what you're trying to do. I mean, at most, there is a huge amount of sympathy and support for making uh, the administration of HSS and related services really work for most of the country. And uh, I think capturing that and getting yourselves positioned both symbolically and budget-wise uh, in, that, in that stream of activity uh, is very important and very promising. Uh, with that, let's have coffee and continue the conversation. Thank you.